Jacob Johns is from the Hopi people and he's one of the working group members of the Earthwise Connector. Uh, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's such a beautiful space to share with all of your beautiful faces, some uh, familiar faces and some new faces. So it's a wonderful, a wonderful circle globally that we're sharing through this morning or this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are. Um, I wanted to just invite everybody to take a deep breath as we kick off the session this morning. And um, I wanted to just everybody to, if you're willing and able, to feel relaxed and get into a comfortable position and start to breathe. This practice of breathing is called hyota, and this is a practice that we do spiritually in the mornings. Uh, as we sit uh, with our eyes closed, it's, imagine us sitting on the earth in the darkness in the night, and we anticipate that we're facing towards the sunrise, and as the sun rises, we anticipate it and feel the light come and touch the top of our head. And as we take a deep inhale, we imagine the light going down from the crown of our head down into our bodies, filling up our heads and going down into our neck, down into our shoulders. And as we exhale, we exhale the darkness and the stress and all of the things that are trapped inside of our body that we are releasing out with our exhales and we are returning back the light that was given to us by creation. And as the sun rises in this dark space and it gets higher and higher into the sky and you take deep breaths, imagine the light going down through your neck, through your shoulders, into your chest, removing all of the darkness and replacing it with light that is trapped in your body and feel it pulling up the darkness that is trapped in your being. And as you inhale, you replace that darkness with light. Feel the light going down into your abdomen down into your pelvis area, down into your calves. Feel the light being pulled down with your breath. And as you exhale, you pull out the darkness and the stress and the worry that is given to us by the darkness. We replace it with the light, the light of creation, the light of the new dawn, the light of the new day, until our bodies are completely filled with light going down from our calves, down into our ankles, and finally out of our toes. And as this being of light, I want you to feel the brightness of your own soul, the brightness of your own being inside of yourself and what you think is your body. And I want you to really feel the stress of the world and how you are protecting the light that's contained inside of your body. And it feels stressful and it feels heavy and you could feel it in your shoulder blades. I want you to really focus on the space between both of your shoulder blades, right near the spine, where so many of us carry stress and carry tension and feel the weight of the world in these two spots. On the left side and the right side, really feel the stress and the worry and all of the pain that we have to endure being focused into these two spots. And as you breathe in the light, Feel those two spots, those two painful spots stuck between your shoulder blades pulling out. And each two spots gets pulled out and stretched and stretched until these two points become wings. And these wings can be anything that you have ever seen in nature, anything that you desire, and every imagined wing that you could possibly comprehend is possible. And feel with each breath the wings get growing out of your body and the pain being transmuted into wings and feel your wings stretch. Feel your wings stretch like they were your arms, like as if you were waking up first thing in the morning. Feel the wings that you have created out of the pain and the sadness of the world come out of your body and give you the strength to stretch. Feel the weight of the world becoming lighter. Feel the pain and the darkness trapped inside of your body become freedom, become movement, to become emanation. I invite you to feel your wings stretch as strong as they possibly can. Feel them flap with your movements of your body and feel the true essence of what you are and why you've came here to endure, to transmute, and to become.
I invite you all to take a deep breath in. Feel your wings flap and stretch and move and exhale. I invite you all to open your eyes and look at yourself digitally, look at your lovely sisters and your lovely brothers around the world who have come together in this space to share and to learn and to grow. Much love and blessings to all of you. Thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you for grounding us so beautifully. And with that, I'd love to call in another working group member from the Earthrise Collective, Rachel Knight, to introduce our next speaker. Hi, everybody. It is a real joy and an honor to be here. Um, I had the delight of interviewing Mpathaleni Maka Ulele, one of our friends and uh, a real, like, extraordinary um, and very highly participating member in the in um, Earthrise. And uh, we had an interview the other, yesterday, and we're going to play back that interview. She um, is in the field doing her amazing work. So um, with no further ado, Mpathaleni Maka Ulele is the founder and executive director of the Mupo Foundation. In 1999, Mpathaleni built the Luvhola Cultural Village with the help of community members. And in 2007, she founded the Mupo Foundation. And there, she works to protect seed diversity and ensure, ensure food sovereignty, to restore the traditional power of Venda women, and to empower youth by reconnecting them with their elders and heritage, and to protect Mupo, which is which means all of creation or in the natural world, by strengthening the indigenous Venda knowledge system in which spirituality is rooted in ecology. Thank you so much. Uh, Dan and Tracy, if you could play the recording. And today we're talking about sacred sites as places of, of deep learning um, and as ecoversities. So my first question is, um, yes. what has been your experience of learning from sacred sites um, directly? What have you learned from your time living in and visiting sacred sites? And how were those lessons and teachings communicated to you? And how have they changed your heart, changed your life, opened your mind, uh, opened your life? What has, what, tell me about it. Uh, mm, the experience which I have in my lifetime about to Zipo. Zipo is the, the vendor weight uh, of uh, what is translated to be sacred sites, but we call them Zipo. My lifetime, I cannot know what gave me that path. Because when I I remember at primary school, there was a forest near our primary school where when we were growing and going to the mountains, to the valleys, forest to pick the fruits and the fetch wood. But that, that is spot of the green, always green forest. I was young. There was nobody who taught us that you do not go there. But the language was that it is a repo. It's a repo. And when we, 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 we grow up, when they say repo, we don't see anyone going there to do anything even to pick the fruits when we see like we have the fruit called mbubulu they are yellow fruits you can see them there but you will never go there i grew up knowing that it is report 
we cannot go there. And uh, I relocate from uh, the first primary school. My father took us to another village, to another primary school. Behind that school, there was also a mountain called Dumbini at the Muzinga school. Dumbini, when we are playing as children, we were hearing the stories that if you go there up at Dumbini, you will never come again. Here at Dumbini, there was there is a person who has one hair, one ear, one nose, three, one, everything, one, one. And always it was said is a river. And behind that school, that mountain, there was a flat area at the foot of Dumbini Mountain. We will only reach there at the foot and pick fruits. We don't climb up there. And this thing, I was not knowing that is my passion, is my interest, but I was always wanting to 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 eat that it is like for me when we are little children sitting at the fireplace when the elders start storytelling. We enjoy and we become inquisitive or wanting to listen. For me, Zippo, make me like that. I I I, I grow up with this feeling of Zippo that is something interesting, special. When I was at secondary school, my father made me so sad because there was a trip at this high school to go to Lake Funduzi. And at the assembly, they said, yes, you must come and pay. The bus will be taking you to Lake Funduzi. The principal addressing us. When I go home to my mother and tell her that there is a trip to Lake Funduzi, it's my mother who should tell our father, but my father also wants us to come and tell her. Then I climb up because when we go to my father's place, we climb. Then when I go to my father and do Russia and request that money to pay for the trip, my father got angry and he even shout aloud, you do not go to Zippo. You can't go to Funduzi. That school, no, no, no. They must not take you to Funduzi and not to other children. Take you to Funduzi. You will not go to Funduzi. I cried. I cried. Yes, the other children went there. I was so sad that my father hit me. That he, he denied me to go to Funduzi. You know, I grow up and grow up. But the place which all around Venda where they said is Ripo, I just feel some feeling that this is something interesting to me and wanting it, that it must be protected, it must be safe. That's how when I in 1998, after I graduated the junior degree at the University of Bender, life missed me. I found myself going to stay in the forest of Zipo, of our clan at Uruhola. But all the way when we grow up, we hear Makazi, when we do ceremony, when we greet Makazi, then he salute us by the totem and the name of Ripo. Like us, he will say, Mukwebo, Nguluwe Kuruya Ruonde. Ruonde is our Ripo to my clan. Zibiam Tata is there. This is the other bush pigs in Rubola. But I found myself at Rubola with difficulties. And I find myself staying there. I was staying in an abandoned farm where nobody was staying there, no one. It was just a forest. When you get in the house, you have to make a path for you. I don't know what told me in that hospital to fight with the doctors and run away to that place. 
because my uncle was installed a chief at that area but never stayed there because it was a government house but it was a farm for another farmer i don't know what took me there and i stayed there close to full two years in that place on my own and when i was staying there i was going to communities talking about the repo senior millet bringing back the life of our culture nature was the important thing to me but i was staying on my own i will sit and listen to the elders because that time because i was free because in my life at 16 years i was cut off from the indigenous way or our cultural or spiritual i was forced to to live another way of life mm -hmm. but when i was there at Ulubola, i began to reconnect back because i was free to go to any village i want i will sit with the people of tiziwe tate to listen to them when they talk about their tate to thunder to many many people to change I become fortunate to have time to listen, to learn from the elders, to learn from my own Makati because she was then very old. And I learned deeper. I remember my Makati when I go to her, she will sleep with me on the bed and hold me like a baby when she tell me, all about our culture, about me, Patelini, my name, about the clan. And then she will hold me like a baby. And when we eat, she eat with me in the same bowel. If we were eating chicken meat, as we all to eat chicken, not to this other, she will take a piece of meat and after that and put me on oh. the mouth. We have false teeth. She also has false teeth. Then there is this little Vaseline container where she will take off the teeth and put in the water there and take mine and put and wash together. <laughs> and after washing, she will take this and put me. She will go with me to the river and bath me. She will put water at home and said, come and jump in that bath. She was doing many things when she was, I, I didn't know that it was teaching that time, but I was just enjoying to be, to be spoiled by my makati. She was very, very old. Those years deepened me, deepened me. And that's how I started to stand against the destruction of PP, the waterfall. When I heard that the government want to do the, the, the hotel at PP, the sacred place, that touched me and I feel like somebody's chopping me. Mm. And I went to look for, to hunt the people of Ramunangi. These are the custodian of PP. Said with the very, very old elders, learning from them, understanding, and connecting them to meet the elders of Tate, Butanda, Chende, Ulumpaira, Chivare, many other elders. And I remember when we talk about Zipo, they started whispering that we can't talk aloud about this thing. But for me, because I experienced the domination of this religious at university, because I was labeled as a demon person during my time at university. I had the strength that I will find a way to speak this aloud. I got blessed because while I was doing this, I started to build the cultural village, which it was named those times in the forest with the elders. And the way I do that, people started to recognize me, recognize me. Department of Education, the tourists also, these tour operators, 
this is where I become outside now to learn and blessed that I connect with these other people from outside. The Zifo came that way. And this path take me to learn deeper, 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 because fighting people, the waterfall, make me to spend three years writing the profiles of Zipo. We call it profile, but knowledge around, deep, deep knowledge, because to write those three, three profiles, I have to spend days there in the community, following them. When they do their ceremonies, they invite me. Elders will come in to me and they will stay with me. They make me to meet their other people in there so that I get that knowledge. Mm -hmm. This is where in Zomalamupo, we we established Zomalamupo. And I remember when we established Zomalamupo, we sleep two nights and spend three days. Even at night, we were doing dialogue to deep, deep understand what is Zipo. We were at Butanda describing, making it understood the word Zipo. And this is where we developed the principles of Zipo. Through Zomolomupo, I know you are teaching young people about z sacred sites, Zipo. And I know you are taking them to Lake Fundudzi, actually. Um, how do you make sure that all the wisdom you have learned along the way gets passed on to young generations and that they also find sacred sites to be places of learning? I do not teach them. Because the work, the, the task which we are doing about to already people are looking for the path, looking for the way to find the solution experiencing. I am invited by the people who want the, 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 the solution on the problems which they are experiencing about the Zipo. Because you can teach a person about Zipo. You can describe Zipo, but it will be just description. Zipo, you feel it. Zipo, mm -hmm. you, you moves with you because Zipo is A, it's more, yeah. Mm -hmm. Zipo is not just it. That place where the point is a Zipo. It's the spirit. It's a Mupo spirit, Mupo drive, Mupo teacher, Mupo learning. Zipo is not to be taught. We can describe them as government has yes, to understand what are we wanting to, to protect. But Zipo is more, yeah. Zipo is spirit. Zipo is A. That's how I can respond. I don't teach Zipo. I can stand and describe like the way I'm doing. I can describe the Zipo until the end of the day, as I can describe a mobile until the end of the day. Not me alone. Last Wednesday, we, were, we spent hours talking about what is Zipo. The whole agenda was never done because the point Zipo comes, the expectation of government when we are writing this biocultural protocol. There's a question about defining, describing people. The whole agenda was put away. We spent the whole day describing, talking about people. And the elder said, it's more young. She is a young, young Makazu from Sicily. She can describe people and you can make a minute book. <laughs> and that knowledge is not taught. There's no one who taught her that this is people. You feel it, it gets in you. It's more, yeah. It's spirit. This I is think the you see, when you walk, you are not taught to walk. You just step, 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 step. My last question is, um, 
What advice do you have to people who want to approach Zifo as places of deep learning? Can a regular person go on their own and just have their own learning experience? And if yes, how should they conduct themselves and how should they act respectfully as they enter this Zifo, the sacred site? As Chilizis told us last week that Zifo is Shango. Shango is the big territory which includes rivers, mountains, values, everything up to everything which is there. We have a problem that people want to go to the heart. We describe that place as the heart of Shifu, that place which we point that is a sacred site. Shifu is a muya which is there in the Shango. People who want to go to Shifu, from our learning, from our experiences, from the way we see how the destruction forces are coming, our advice is Zoma Lamupo. Go to the elders, custodians of that shango and get the people, custodians of that repo of that shango because they are the one who know the protocols spiritually, not laws of government. As Jesus said, repo is shango, is the whole land. Sit with the elders and the custodians and learn about their Zipo. Because going straight to that place, as I said in the beginning, it's not a place for people to go inside there. Once we go inside there, look at that. If people can enter at that heart, they will destroy the Muya of that place. Mm. My advice is connect with the elders because there's no way we can learn Zipo at university or at the government pamphlet or at the advertisement of his tourism. Zipo is not a tourist, it's a spiritual healing. And not that you are sick, you need healing. The spirit needs us to get calm. Mm. My advice is to first go and connect with the elders of that Shango and find the elders of that Shifo and sit with them. They will guide us because they are the guide. As the founder prophet say, Mutukana e wenda mukala. Mutukana e ndi wenda mukala. It shows that an elder is an experiential teacher. Because he or she has experience of this thing. A young boy learned to enter, learning from the footprint of the elders. That's my advice. As the Malamobo, we have a, a threat, which is a problem, which is a pain, when people just want to enter in the repo, in that heart of repo. Zipo is Shango. Zipo, when you arrive at that Shango, you have arrived at Zipo. It's only there is a heart of Zipo where it's not for human beings to do things, to harvest, to do things. That's why that spot, that place is only meant to go and do ceremonies and walk back and go home. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much to Mpateleni. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that conversation with Mpateleni and uh, really taking us into the heart of Jufo, uh, or Jufo, which is the name of sacred natural sites uh, in the Bender language. And from the south of the, of the planet, I would like to go to the far north now and to invite Grandmother Helen Lindmark um, from the Sami people of Sweden. Uh, onto the stage. And uh, Grandmother Helen, as we very fondly call her, is a guardian of the Sami timeless traditions, and she intricately weaves her essence into the vibrant tapestry of modern society and guides you home to your own origin, to the source within you. She's a trauma specialist who works to shift from the collective trauma to the present, helping move from your trauma presenting your limitations to embracing them as gifts. Grandmother Helen bridges the voice between traditional knowledge 
and the contemporary understanding of sustainable practices. Welcome, Grandmother Helen. And Thank you. I'd love, to, I'd love to learn from you all the way up in the north near the Arctic Circle, <laughs> what you have learned from sacred natural sites directly, and how have these lessons and teachings communicated to you? And how perhaps have they opened your mind or your heart or even changed your life? So I, um, I come from above the Arctic Circle and uh, grown up in a home, I would say would be between Sami, Swedish and the minority people, which was not always easy. But one thing my grandmother was very precious and my grandfather too, it was to honor the earth, really to listen to the earth. So as, as long as I remember, she always told me, my grandmother, that you have to remember, Helen, that she's the one who carry you 24 hours. It's not you who carry you. She's the one who is holding the space for you. And, and then, I always was born in a very gifted family. I had a knowing beyond the knowing, but I was also born in a very religious family. So it was to be in between. And when I was 10 years, I understood what she meant because we were out picking berries. And uh, my aunt wasn't, she was in the head and not in the wholeness of herself. So she was running in the swamp and suddenly she was almost gone. And my father and me and my mother need to help to drag her up. And then when we came home, my grandmother said that to my aunt, oh, now you haven't been careful. Now you haven't been listening, she said, because you walked too far. You didn't walk with love. So the ground took you. And that is the strongest memory I have, how it can happen. And um, I think the teachings was more a feeling. It was beyond the words. Uh, it was a very home with few words where we didn't really speak, but where we were learned to listen, where we were learned to feel, and where we were learned to look around us. What is the environment around us? What is the nature telling us? I mean, we didn't have any compass or any time really. It was just being with the cycles. And that is the deepest, I think. And when you come to sacred places, it's a place of, you know, it's a vibration. It's, a, it, it's embody you in a special way. It, um, so the forest, I'm born in a, in a forest family where they work with forests, where they were caretaker of the forest also. And, and also, I'm born in a generation of reindeer deer herders, where we learned about the footprint of the animals, to see them, to see how they are moving and where they are. And they were more, nature was the compass of my life. So um, it was a teaching that was beyond the words. And I was always interested in human beings. Who are we as human beings? So I educated myself. I started with children. I go to elders, go to people with disabilities, I handicaps, and then I educated myself as um, in special care for psychiatry, where I, I worked with trauma. And the first time I worked, I made a break. Uh, the first four years I worked, I was feeling like, wow, is this the world we are living in? Is this what humanity is doing to our earth? And then I take a break because I got a child. And, um, and I started again after one year. And then I saw the importance of bringing, without judgment, without values, bringing people home. and that is my life journey. Everything I experienced, I say to everyone, we have all a universal library. Remember, it's not about the mistakes. It's about the teachings and the learnings. 
and all the meetings we have along the way. Sometimes we don't understand them, but in a certain time we will do that. And I did that. My, when I started to dedicate myself to this was when I was 37, I had a heart attack, life stopped. I thought I had everything. I thought that um, I could run from this. And, and then everything, my father after five years, he said that you have to walk your route, Salam. You have to come home, you have to go to the forest and you have to listen. And I had forgot how to listen. How do you listen? How do you listen in, in here? How do you listen? So I, um, I went home and for almost three weeks, he encouraged me to go back. And every day I came home, he said, you don't listen, Helen. And one day, almost three weeks away, it happened. The nature was like a coat over me and it embodied me. Like I could feel the vibration of the earth. I could feel the vibrations of the trees, of the leaves, of the plants. And, and I started to shaking my whole body. And that's when my mind and heart, and that's the, when the change come. And I knew I can't run from this anymore. I'm here to stewarding for my mother, and that's Mother Earth. So that's when it started. Thank you so much. Such deep learning from Mother Earth. And yet I'm aware that the place and territory is very important for you and for your community. But that territory that you grew up in has faced a lot of destruction, a lot of destruction of the indigenous lands. And how has this impacted the ability for the sacred site to be a teacher? In my village, we had 42 sacred sites that was placed as sacred sites. It could be a rock, it could be a place, it could be a, a lake. Um, but I was born 69 and the mining started 61. So I'm born with that vibration also. I have seen this giant machine always um, being there and and uh, every week it was vibrating every week it was a dynamite and and when I was young I didn't see it but I didn't feel it in the same way but when they starting to test drilling I have testimonies to see how the forest starting to die, how the, there were no more um, growth in, in the earth because when you drilling, you are taking away the original structures of the roots and it kills, it kills uh, ancestry, it kills a memory, it, it, it makes a confusion and um, so after maybe in the beginning of 2000, they started and 22 years later, they took the village uh, in May. And um, how it impacted our people and how this destruction is impacting my people, it's really in so many ways beyond the physical body. It's so many ways beyond the words because it really makes a feeling that I really, I really can't describe it. It's an emptiness. You don't, no more, I feel like I don't have a belonging anywhere. I know I have my belonging in my heart, but I can not be there to show my grandchildren where they come from. I can never take them to that land because now there's a mining there. There's a mining for copper and gold for 10 years, and then they will close it. Then they have taken what they take. That's, uh, and when they took our house and when they took our land, many, of, inclusive my father and my aunt, became sick. They get heart problems, they get lung problems, and it really, really affected us in a health way. And Sometimes I ask my father why I've been sick so much through the last years. He says that you need to be that to understand, Helen, because for the work you're going out in the world, 
because you have to experience that. And I think that, and it's kind of a, how can you say we, we are, um, they are taking our souls for a, a price that we'll gain for some couple of years. And, and it's not only, it's not only us as humans, but the nature, it's a really a suffering. And we can see it in everything when we look around us. So it really has affected us in a very, very physically and mentally and spiritual way. Because when it comes to the spirituality, I mean, my ancestry has been walking there for years. There were no doctors in the beginning. There were no roads. They've been walking. And, and I come from one of the families that, where the home was an open home for both healing in a mentally and a physically way. And that I can't, I can't, I can't tell the stories for my grandchildren, but I can never bring them back. And so there's deep trauma that's associated with the destruction of the lands and that deep trauma extends towards our physical bodies as well um, and therefore our abilities to learn so how do we work with the trauma related with this and how can this trauma be a space or a route to deep learning or maybe to unlearning yes trauma is we have trauma in different layers we have the ancestral trauma, we have the land trauma, we have the mountain trauma and the water trauma. In, we say underneath us, there are many, 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 many rivers, many, many, many lakes, many, many waters that have been flowing for generations of generations from the beginning of the beginning. And all that water contains memories. All that water contains information that is stored in us, as it's stored in the blood and the bones. So if I look at my, we are colonized, we had, we didn't have the war, but the destruction, the pollution, and the, the, the violence, very, very violent. And also something that is very, very dangerous is the silence of being taken the voice and not be able to speak, not to be able to sing the traditional songs, not be able to working with the traditional drums. And that has been for century back. And then I'm coming to the collective trauma. And they've been fighting and they've been trying to survive. They've been dying with this griefing, they've been dying with this silence. And it's really important to embody, to really to reconnect to what is the land I'm coming from? What is my ancestry? So I know who I am. Who is Helen? Where does she come from? What is, what is the obstacle in her journey? And how does it affect us in reality life? Because we can bridge this collective trauma to be healed by learning by speaking, by seeing, by deeply, deeply listening to each other, without words, just being present as we are, and also respecting. The only thing that the collective trauma is really wanting, it is to us to be here and stewarding for the earth and being as doing the work we are doing and walking and taking care of her. And, and how can we do that in the best way? That is also to respect, but also embrace the ones that walk before us, not put it away. Because do they really want us to fight? They want us to be present in a time and do what is needed. They want us to speak. They want us to bring the knowledge out. They want, they don't want Really, they want us to fight in the way of being respectful to ourselves, being respectful to, to them. And um, when I see 
um, these spaces of trauma, where I often meet because it's what I'm doing, it is when I come for healing of a trauma for a land, I always present myself who I am, where I come from. And I feel, and the feeling that the land gives me, give me a knowing what is needed for this land, but also to see it because sometimes we think that we leave and no one has listened. And then this energy is going on and on like a machine in us. And, but for us, it's time to listen now. It's time to be present and listen in this time. And, and that's for us who are here now, but also for the ones who will come, that we are, you know, um, um, really looking into the values we have. Am I respecting myself? Am I true to myself? Do I trust myself? Why am I carrying this anger? Well, this is source of anger. I, I mean, maybe I don't have a reason to be angry, but I feel this vibration in me. Then it can be a vibration, the destruction or the colonizing or the separation of the land. That is how it affects us. Because then life as a human being, I mean, I live in so many worlds. Sometimes it's very hard for me to survive in the real life, in the society life, but it is a part of me because I am a grandmother to two children and soon three. I am a mother and I am a daughter to my father. So it's really, it's really about trauma we can heal when we start to see each other and communicate. When we don't when we are transparent and meeting each other as we are, we don't have to understand it in an understandable way, but we just be respectful and take responsibility. Thank you so much, Grandmother Helen. Thank you for reminding us that the trauma of the land and the destruction of our sacred present and spaces is made perhaps a lot of what we're experiencing in the world in the crisis we have today and reminding us to go back to listen to our ancestors and also to listen to those that are yet to come to the descendants that are coming thank you so much and uh, with that we'd like to just take a bit of a break to go into deep prayer and ceremony for the next five minutes where we call in from the andes um, our brother wanka inti um, from the wanka people of Peru to come and just take us into a place of prayer as we digest that which um, our two sisters have shared with us today. So Wanka Inti. In this moment, or should we start? I understood that we're going to wait. No, están dándote la bienvenida. No, actually, they are welcoming you. And oh, okay, thank you. It's so nice to see you all. Thank you. When they speak, all the worlds are open and, and Mikoka vibrates. Uh, it's, uh, it's okay, so we are going to, to wait then. Are we doing a, a pause or do I have to talk a testimony? Um, if you can just uh, do a prayer. Si a puedes prayer. hacer una oración. Bien. Gracias. Eh, primero quiero saludar los mensajes de mis antecesores, porque esto es la historia que se está reconstruyendo aquí en estas pantallas. 
gracias a la tecnología, ahora podemos hacer esa magia que nuestros ancestros hacían en vivo, en físico. Estaban aquí y estaban allá y al otro lado, al mismo tiempo. Voy a pedir a Mariela que me ofrezca el fuego sagrado porque ella es mi complemento. Mariela Coyures quien siempre me apoya. pregunta en el chat a mi hermano Jacob porque esto me recuerda la meditación que practicó allá en Dubai entiendo que es un ritual Hopi porque sentados o echados cerrando los ojos y practicando la respiración uno viaja a mundos entonces, los cóndores lo hacemos cantando también. Yo quiero que ustedes vean en estos momentos, porque mi hermana Rutendo me ha dicho, observen lugares sagrados. El primer lugar sagrado que podemos ver nosotros desde miles de años es el mundo de arriba, el Hanaj Pacha. Observen entonces con los ojos abiertos o cerrados mirando la pantalla la inmensidad de nuestros multiversos, la inmensidad de los ecoversos, siendo tú un, una versión de ese multiverso, de ese ecoverso. En cada estrella puede ser una estrella real o puede ser el alma el espíritu de alguien que evolucionó hoy está guiando tus pasos. Observa las formaciones. Aquí particularmente desde el sur vemos a la gran llama, hermana, prima hermana del cabello. Observen la cruz del sur. Cuando estuve en Sudáfrica, también vi la hermosa cruz del sur. Observen los animales sagrados. Todo está en las estrellas en el firmamento. Pero cuando volvemos a la tierra, nuestros abuelos tejedores construyeron esos cuatro mundos que existen en las telas. Se puede construir en barro, en piedra. En tela está para nosotros el gran mensaje, los cuatro mundos. Hermanos, hermanas, en cada mundo hay lugares sagrados, en cada mundo hay apus, en cada mundo hay huacas. Vean en este gráfico, cuando nosotros hacemos el Hanak Pacha Hawaii, o sea, cerramos los ojos, respiramos por barriga, le decimos a las personas que lleven el ojo hacia arriba, mientras inhalan, mientras respiran, y con el ojo mirando arriba al centro, ojos cerrados, llegan al Hanaj Pacha, el mundo de arriba, y se encuentran con el Padre Sol, la Madre Luna, las estrellas, y pueden ir volando en sus animales de poder, el águila, el cóndor, el quetzal, todas las aves que viajan hacia el mundo de arriba, y nos encontramos con esos lugares sagrados. 
pero cuando botamos el aire, nuestros ojos bajan y buscan el mundo interior tuyo y de la tierra. Y entonces ahí estamos viendo a los animales de la noche, el murciélago, la serpiente, Quetzalcoatl, el dragón. Y entramos a la oscuridad y ahí también hay lugares sagrados, los ocelotes, los túneles interiores todo lo que es oscuridad de este mundo y de los otros mundos son lugares sagrados. Pero también decimos que mientras inhalamos el aire con los ojos cerrados, llevamos la vista hacia la derecha para buscar otro lugar sagrado muy secreto que los estirpadores de idolatrías quisieron estirparnos, quitarnos y no han podido. Ese es el mundo sagrado del Jaguapacha, el mundo exterior. Y entonces llegamos a las galaxias, formaciones en espiral, formaciones de cangrejo, formaciones de animales, pero eso es ya muy lejano. Allí se encuentran lo que muchos llaman registros akáshicos. Allí se encuentran los grandes secretos del pasado, del presente y el futuro. Puedes formar parte de la nada que es el todo. Y entonces, ahí llegan algunos animales, el colibrí, el picaflor, le decimos, la paloma mensajera. Y cuando botes el aire, regresas al mundo de aquí con el ojo hacia la izquierda. Y en el mundo de aquí tenemos los grandes apus, que son las montañas sagradas, que cuando uno ingresa a un lugar sagrado, los abuelos dicen que hay que entregar un cumplido y pedir permiso. Nosotros lo hacemos con hojitas de, de coca, con agua florida, con flores, con dulces. Y entregamos enterrando a la tierra, diciéndole montaña sagrada, lugar sagrado. Reconócenos, somos tus hijos. Protégenos. Hemos venido a entregarte, a conversar contigo. Yo recuerdo un canto que mi abuela, aquí en estos momentos me llama y me dice que les cante a ustedes esta canción sagrada. Está en lengua antigua y luego lo traduzco. Aquí estoy en el lugar sagrado donde nadie nos ve para conversar contigo gran espíritu cantando esa canción y yo era niñito ella nunca habló castellano solo me hablaba en huanca lima y lengua preinca y me hacía entregar las hojitas de coca enterrada en la tierra y entonces me decía ahora sí hijo la gran montaña nos va a proteger y caminábamos y subíamos ya podía correr como niñito por las grandes montañas sin temor a nada porque sabía que a mi abuela había pedido protección. Eso es lo que siempre se tiene que hacer cuando uno ingresa a lugares sagrados, hermanos. El respeto, la reciprocidad. Pero también hay lugares sagrados que se llaman huacas. Mi hermana Rutendo ha llegado a conocer la huaca, una de las huacas importantes en esta tierra de los cóndores, el Machu Picchu. Inmediatamente ella se remontó a su historia y también nos dice que allá en tiempos antiguos, por Mozambique, en su tierra encontró esas mismas formaciones. Son huacas, lugares sagrados. ¿Pero qué es una huaca? Un lugar energético donde las personas desde hace miles de años invocan a los apus a las deidades y hay lenguaje mis hermanos este lenguaje que yo estoy hablando con ustedes se llama runa simi la lengua del hombre puedo hablar en lengua milenaria también es lengua de hombre pero cuando tú entras en trance 
y a veces ya no necesitas cerrar los ojos. Empiezas a hablar el lenguaje de los incas, el lenguaje de los hijos del sol. Pero también puedes hablar el apusimi. Ya sentir el mensaje del cerro, el mensaje de las aguas, el mensaje de las montañas. Y puedes dar al regreso ese mensaje a tus hermanos. Y entonces, porque podríamos pasar horas y horas hablando, reflexionando, con ustedes he visitado en esta oportunidad lugares sagrados de los cuatro mundos, de las cuatro direcciones. Pero recuerda, el mejor lugar sagrado es lo que está en ti. Porque tú no eres viajero de este tiempo. Tú eres viajero de todos los tiempos. El hidrógeno que llevas es el hidrógeno que tiene el Padre Sol y todas las estrellas que con helio mezclados brillan. Hoy veo brillar en ti tu corazón. Hoy veo brillar en mí tu corazón, tus ojos. Urpiyay son joyay. Gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brother Wanka, for taking us to the stars and deep within as the sacred site and this continuum from the macro to the micro. And with that, we'd like to call in a founder of uh, the Earthrise Collective, uh, Proven Mukli, um, who is just going to round it all up, you know, from the legal to the cosmic. Uh, everything that makes sacred sites as ecoversities. So calling in Proven Mutli into the space. Thank you so much, uh, Gogo Rotendo. And always uh, wonderful to follow Brother Wonka Inti because he creates an energetic pathway to the cosmos, uh, takes us on a cosmic journey, and then brings us back. So thank you so much, Brother Wonka Inti. Um, so I'll say a few things and go on a bit of a journey myself. Uh, so let's start by uh, asking the question, why sacred versities? Uh, for me, the key thing is because we are sacred beings. Everything about us is sacred. And if we're talking about uh, anything sacred, we can't uh, not look into ourselves first because we carry energy. We are connected to the cosmos. Um, and we are connected to, to everything. We, as you know, are electromagnetic beings. We vibrating atoms, uh, like, uh, you know, the rest of, rest of the cosmos. So how do we, uh, ensure that as sacred beings, we start with us before even looking at what's outside of us. So in Brazil recently for the eco universities, global gathering. Uh, Manish, myself, and many others were talking about uh, this idea of there's, you know, so many different types of ecoversities. Um, what about sacred versities? And we decided to have a ceremony uh, just as the, the, the full moon was around. Um, and it was a beautiful ceremony. Uh, it had two parts, one showing us the turmoil, the uh, conflict, uh the mess we are in on the other hand showing us the lightness the beauty uh the love uh you know that exists and often that exists together but also what a thin veil it is between uh each other and that even though everything feels heavy uh, a lot of things feel dark a lot of conflict a lot of kids uh you know dying in 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 uh, gaza and every other place on the planet uh you know how how does one hold that and try and shift that uh and, and at the same time create a pathway out of the mess we are in so i just got back last night from uh, colombia where the un convention on biological diversity is happening uh a, a big uh, gathering uh, of many different people governments and um, communities from across the globe society uh businesses and so on 
the key thing is that we're losing bio biodiversity as a, at a rapid rate. Since I was born, 70% of the species on the planet have been uh, lost uh, and now extinct. We know from the climate science that we've now reached a point where we thought we'd maybe reach it in the in in the um, uh, in in about a decade from now, but we've already reached the point where um, monthly for for twelve months we've been at one point five degrees, um, which uh, means we're already seeing a lot of the destruction you know that that's going on, especially communities that are vulnerable and and we know the injustices and inequalities, and and how people that are more vulnerable. I have to uh, unfortunately deal with you know very harsh realities. I was also in in deep in the Amazon with the Sahara people recently, and just seeing you know we read these articles in the newspapers and so on, but seeing the Amazon uh, Amazon forest uh, or jungle being mowed down, uh, illegal logging, trucks just you know mowing down and and taking uh, trees away, uh, looking at the fires, which are bigger than the size of the, the country, Sri Lanka at the moment in the Amazon. Uh, but also that they've got the worst ever recorded drought, um, you know, since uh, anything the recordings have, have, have begun. So all of that's quite clear. We see it, we feel it, we understand it, um, and so on. So the question is, um, what do we do? And, you know, our brother Bayo from Nigeria often reminds us when times are urgent, let's slow down because our tendency is to try and fix the world, try and, you know, look for the answers on the outside. Uh, and, you know, largely businesses are coming up with all these grand schemes, um, trade in carbon credits to do ge geoengineering, uh, you know, to, uh, and, and presenting that as solutions. But we do know that communities that are connected to the land, connected to, to nature, uh, have a lot to teach us uh, and we have a lot to, to learn because the way they live their lives is not that uh, we are part of nature, but what they say is we are nature and, and they are fully uh, you know, integrated. So as I was growing up, uh, and as I started, uh, you know, uh, working and, and became a lawyer, I was taken to many parts uh, across the globe uh, to various countries. And I didn't understand. I mean, I knew why I was there for the legal perspective, but I didn't quite understand why I was being taken to certain mountains, caves, you know, other places. It did feel sacred, but I, but I didn't fully understand it. But in 2019, uh, I spent a lot of time in Hurikwaho or Table Mountain in Cape Town. And the mountain took me deeper and deeper inside. And then I started, you know, listening to the mountain, hearing things from the mountain. And, and I was taught many things. And then I realized fully that actually you don't need a person to teach you or, or books to teach you. But, you know, these sacred places ha have a lot um where it, it, it kind of opens you up. And one of the things that I was shown was that there are these big sacred points of the planet. There's many, many sacred sites, as Grandmother Helen spoke about, the many sites even in her community or her country, or, or uh, as Wanka Inti has spoken about, or in Pataleni as well. But I was shown the science of how these sacred sites work, uh, what the science behind them is, but more importantly, why it's important to work with these key sites. And what I was shown is, you know, like we have sacred sites or sacred energy points in our body, the earth has got a chakra system as well, a system of energy. And the whole idea is that because the energy is blocked, uh, it doesn't flow fully at the moment. The idea is the activation of, of the different points so that the energy flows. And the idea is that there would be a Kundalini awakening of Pachamama uh, as, as as a whole. But as uh, you know, I've shown this, and as I started connecting with others, and as many of us from different continents have been going to these key sacred sites, you then start to realize that it's not about you activating sites. 
these places activate you and opens you up. And so, you know, every place I've been to, you know, with, with many others, I start to learn, you know, the, the ideas about the universe um, and, 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 and how all of this works and how we are such minuscule, tiny, vibrating atoms as part of something uh, massive. And so for me, the biggest lesson uh, as a starting point is the interconnectedness of everything. You know, we all know this and we all uh, understand it to, to different extents. But the idea that we've been so separated and we've been separated to the point, uh, like a breaking point, and, and we are breaking at the moment. But part of the breaking is to unify and, and to pull, you know, to pull back. And so as we've gone on that journey of separation, we now are being forced to go back on the journey of unification. But through that process, as uh, Brother Wonka Inti spoke about uh, Pachakawe, which is a contemplation of the universe, I, I learned that the sun is a giver of life, that the moon is a giver of love, and that the stars is a giver of light. And that while we are in the cosmos, the cosmos is actually in, in us. And so as part of the Earthrise Collective, which is looking at ancient wisdom, activism, and alternatives, it's how do we go way back into the ancient uh, knowledge, uh, pull that now in order to create an energetic pathway uh, into the future. And so some of the key things I've learned at, you know, uh, through these uh, sacred sites is that we can tap into this cosmic knowledge, um, even without books or even without people teaching us the knowledge. So each one of us have that potential. It's not something specific to, that certain people have, but we all have, have that uh, potential. So in Egypt, you know, in the Great Pyramid of Giza and Mount Sinai, I, I learned about numbers and frequencies. It, it came to me very clearly, uh, you know, what a zero is, which is nothing. At the same time, it's, it's everything. It's dark energy, dark matter. It's what the whole cosmos um, and, 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 and the universe uh, that we live in uh, comes from, zero. And the reason it came later into the number system is because we didn't understand it as humans, where we come from. Uh, and then, you know, one is is the, the, the creation or the light that came out of the darkness. And, and, you know, I can keep going on, but I was shown, you know, in in, uh, in a very powerful way, those numbers and then also frequencies mm -hmm. and, 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 and the idea of how to shift frequency. So going to these different sacred sites, how I understand it now is that as the energy starts to flow, the frequency starts to shift. So the earth starts to rise in the sense of the frequency. And, and that's that's part of the change process uh, as we enter the new uh, era. And the problem is if the earth is rising and we are part of Pachamama, and, and if we don't rise in our own frequency, then there's a dissonance. And then, you know, we, uh, we are dragged along or pulled along. And I think in many traditions, like uh, Jacob from the Hopi tradition, you know, there's many teachings about the split um, that's happening at the moment that, you know, was drawn in caves thousands of years ago, but we're now seeing the split that's, that's happening uh, here. In Hawaii, I learned about, at, at different sacred sites, learned about the elements and how to work with the elements, nature, in Mount Shasta, I learned about vibration of unconditional love. Uh, Mount Kailash, uh, how to work and tap into divine energy, work with the energy, but also this, how to uh, embark on this process uh, of, of unification. So, you know, I can go on about each of those sites, but uh, each one opens us up and, and teaches us uh, a lot. So a few years ago, many of us from the Earthrise Collective were in Egypt. Uh, and, you know, we, we came up with this analogy of the canoe. So we're currently in a canoe that's breaking up, falling apart, is sinking, people are being thrown over, 
we're trying to fix it, we're trying to uh, reshift its direction, but we're heading into a massive waterfall with this breaking up canoe. And so the question is, what do we do? So on the one hand, we still are in the canoe and we have to try our best to do whatever we can to protect and um, you know, uh, work with what we have left. On the other hand, it, it, it was the new canoe uh, and while the old one is you know, coming apart because it'll be too late to launch a new one once everything's come apart. And so the Earthrise Collective is working with many, many uh, people from different uh, traditions and, and building bridges between the ancient and the modern in, in order to um, you know, create this kind of energetic uh, pathway into the future. So I'll end by uh, you know, making a call to each one of us and, and to, to others that we're in a very specific time on the planet where we have to stand fully in ourselves as sacred beings. The answer is not going to come from somewhere else. The leadership is not going to come from somewhere else. Um, from each one of us and uh, from within uh, ourselves. We have to go uh, beyond these identities we've created, you know, these names that are being given to us and, and who we've created in terms of our identities, because we are much bigger than that. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brother Wonka Inti is a good example of being a cosmic uh, being. Uh, and we all are cosmic beings. We, we just need to explore for. Uh, potential. So some some of the things that you know came to me from uh, uh, so, some uh, let's say uh, leaders, ancestors, people that have passed on, you know, are leaving us hints of of what to do during this time. So the the first thing is it, it's time to reconnect. So within ourselves, with each other, with the rest of nature, we, that reconnection has to happen. It's time to remember who we truly are, where we come from, and why are we here during this time. It's time to resonate, time to re-energize, time to reactivate, it's time to irradiate, and it's time to reverberate. And that's how we need to stand strong within ourselves and then you know, connect with the others. So Earthrise Collective and Ecoversities, you know, it's two big circles that are now coming together in different ways. Um, and and we, we will continue to work on bringing the ancient wisdom, uh, feeding the activism and feeding uh, the alternatives so that we can birth uh, the next uh, era. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, thank you for reminding us of the time that we're in and uh, the critical nature of these intersecting circles between ecoversities and the Earthrise Collective and of course on our sacred sites. And we would have loved to have an interaction with the audience, but uh, we do need to make time and way for the closing ceremony that's happening in the conference. Um, so we'd just like to say that we can take many of these ideas further as the Earthrise Collective will be launching a course uh, in uh, the next uh, month um, on sacred sites. And one of those will actually have a session that will specifically be on sacred sites as universities. Um, the link to the course is, uh, is in the chat at the moment. We will be having a webinar on the 5th of um, of, uh, of November, where we'll be exploring some of the ideas that, for instance, Proven has put through at the moment. And um, yes, just really going deep into these, uh, these, um, these sessions uh, over six weeks, um, beginning on the 19th of November, and uh, giving time for people to go into ceremony over the solstice and then convening once again in January. As you will see, we have incredible teachers on the course, including those that you've met today and others like uh, um, Polyne from Benin, uh, Grandmother Tatiana from Siberia, um, Dahi Bastida from Mexico, Manish, our own Manish will be there as well, and Patileni, who you heard from, uh, Chief Ninawa of the Huniquin in the Amazon, Simon Mutambo, 
um, Helen Millenmark, who we also heard, Wanka Inti, Trevis Amabena, and the Waterman of India, Rajendra Singh, all of whom will be really going deeper, and Geraldine as well, about time and, um, and sacred sites, all of whom will be allowing us to really go deep into these sacred sites, their importance for building regenerative futures. Rachel, would you like to add anything more? Yes, I wanted to also talk about how during the course we will be inviting all the participants to be making relations with the sacred sites near them. Uh, Ritendo and I were just on a call recently with the Advaya folks and we were just chatting about our own experiences with sacred sites and I think of myself as a pretty normative person but when you get to a sacred site there's a way at which it just blows you open and teaches you in ways you couldn't have anticipated but more than that these sacred sites need to be fed. So we'll be inviting participants over the course to find their local sites, which are everywhere hiding and often not well attended, and supporting them to learn how to make offerings and feed the sites and tend to the sites and honor them in the way that those sites are longing to be honored. So even if you live in a city or anywhere, we will be supporting you to make those relationships and learn how to tend and feed and honor these places. Thank you so much, Rachel. Well, we in the Earthrise Collective, it's always important to ground and to root. And we did that at the beginning with Jacob coming in from the Hopi Nation. Um, but there's one continent that we haven't touched at the moment in our session today, and that is Oceania. And so we'd like to go over to Sister Fire, who is in Australia, but she's Mari from New Zealand, who has woken up in the middle of the night in order to be able to give us a grounding as we close the session uh, towards the closing of the Reimagining Education Conference. So, Faya, over to you. Mm. Kia ora, Sister Rutendo, and kia ora, dear family, dear Earthrise family and beyond. Thank you for such a beautiful session. I've learned so much, and I think that's really what it's all about. So I'd like to just take us into some sacred sonics to hear the earth and the stars and all that is in between. I invite you just to close your eyes if you feel comfortable. And as we Listen to the elementals call to us. Breathing into your sacred body.
cravings. sites of the invisible layers of ancestry written on our faces. In the tears of the songs that have gone to another place.
Thank you so much, Sister Fire. Thank you to everybody for joining us in this journey into sacred sites as universities. Thank you.